all glory, authority and dominion be to our heavenly Father, the Almighty, most holy and righteous one, the creator of all. And may his most holy and all powerful name always be praised and adored above everything else. Amen. Beloved, in these end times, God is carrying out all his deeds in accordance with the divine plan that he had in mind concerning his children. And it is only in the end times that we see the completion of all the deeds of God and all that God has been anticipating for thousands of years. This is also the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. All the deeds of salvation that God has prepared for his children are being fulfilled in these end times. And God is preparing his children to receive the full fruit of these salvific deeds. For this purpose, the treasure that God has given us is the Sadwarta or the good news. Beloved, since 2005, the messenger sent by God, that's prophet Isaiah, has proclaimed this Sadwarta or the good news in this world. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, has come again on this earth in flesh. He has come to give us the fullness of salvation. He will transform our weak bodies into his glorious body. And he will make us participants in the body and blood of the Father. He has come to this earth to take the children of God to that eternal kingdom that has been prepared by his Father. For his very own children, a planet prepared as an eternal dwelling place. Behold, he is going to be revealed in the midst of the children of God. This is the Sadwartha, the good news proclaimed by the prophet sent by God. But when the fulfillment of this great plan of God began, Satan has been doing everything possible to oppose this. Beloved, the core objective of Satan is to prevent the children of God from hearing the good news of salvation simply because they are the true heirs of salvation. To achieve this, the group of people who are mostly used by Satan are the Bible scholars or intellectuals. Beloved, we have already seen that in the first coming of the Son of God, those who presumed that they knew everything, mocked, rejected and looked down upon him who possessed the true knowledge of God. Those scribes and intellectuals viewed the Son of God who is the Savior of this world as an ordinary carpenter from Nazareth of Galilee. According to them, he was just a commoner who was not very knowledgeable or scholarly. The discourse of these Pharisees and scribes had only been on the basis of their own intellect. So when they heard the words of life and the divine wisdom from the mouth of the Son of God, they prevented others from listening to him. And how did they justify this act? by stating that this man has no knowledge. He is not learned. Not one of us intellectuals believed in him. So they convinced the people that it is only because they lacked knowledge that they were paying heed to the words of Jesus Christ. And this is how they misled the people and hindered them from going to the Son of God. Today, this is being revealed to you so that you may comprehend the fact that today's history is repeating itself. Because now that the Son of God has come again in flesh and the good news of eternal life has been proclaimed in this world, all the intellectuals and Bible scholars of today's churches are doing the same deed. As we read in the scripture of Luke chapter 11, Verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. 
you did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. So, what is the Lord intending to say? That those people will not enter the kingdom of God and they hindered others from entering as well. We see that in his first coming, the Lord plainly told all those who claimed they knew everything that they would not enter the kingdom of God. And this is true even in his second coming because they were not able to understand nor accept the secrets of the kingdom of God that were proclaimed by the one sent by God. And it is so because it was not meant for them. For in fact, they are not among those who God has predestined to inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, even today, they are stubbornly repeating the errors when they get to know that any child of God wishes to hear this good news of salvation, they will do the best they can by utilizing all the possible resources to obstruct their way. Today, many such means are at their disposal and people are willing to blindly believe such sources. The media, influential organizations and many institutions that are closely associated to them. Therefore, by utilizing such means, they discourage people from listening to the good news much more drastically today than those who did the same thing 2,000 years ago. As we read in the scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, how could you fail to perceive that I was not speaking about bread? Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he had not told them to beware of the yeast of bread, but of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beloved, listen very carefully. In the first coming of Jesus Christ, these Pharisees and Sadducees, the priests and religious authorities were considered to be great scholars. They thought they knew everything and that was the same perception the people had about them. But what did our Lord say to his disciples? Beware of their teachings. Their teachings will lead to your downfall. Would the scholars of that time be able to tolerate this? After spending almost their entire lives in Jerusalem temple, studying the Holy Scriptures, receiving great honors and the anointing to serve the Lord, a carpenter is saying, beware of their teaching, which is equivalent to saying, do not believe them, for their words will lead to your destruction. So would those great scholars be able to tolerate this? Absolutely not. Even Bible scholars today would not be able to digest this. Beloved, churches all over the world are preaching only those things that are pleasing to the world, that are in compliance with the worldly standards. But what they are proclaiming is another gospel while it's being led by another spirit. And these teachings are against the word of truth and even against the apostolic writings. So when the messenger sent by God began to warn the people to beware of such teachings, then Bible scholars and church authorities could not accept this and were greatly provoked. And this is a reality. The prophet Isaiah, through the Spirit of God, has warned God's people Beware of their teachings. So, what happened 2,000 years ago is undoubtedly recurring today. Beloved, it is for this reason that our Lord declared that they are blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. Which pit? The pit of eternal destruction. In the Bible, only one pit that is mentioned is this pit. 
and the time when one could fall in this pit is in the end times. So here, the Holy Spirit is testifying that 2,000 years ago, those who were considered as intellectuals or knowledgeable were in fact ignorant of the truth. Have you read the scripture? It's very pleasant to the ears. We read in scripture, that's Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Now listen carefully. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, is preaching this. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Who were their rulers? The priests, Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So what did the Holy Spirit testify concerning those intellectuals? That they were ignorant, and that is what they truly were. But would they admit this? Never. Neither will they admit it now. So even today, all those who claim to have full knowledge of the Bible are in fact obstructing the works of God and opposing them. And why are they doing this? Because in truth, they are ignorant. The Holy Spirit is testifying that they act out of ignorance and this is being preached through the wisdom of God. And if we are to discern this, we need the Spirit of God. This is a spiritual gift. And that is why a worldly person will never be able to understand these things. But with the Spirit of God, this can be easily discerned. Hence, it's even more clear now that they slander the deeds of God only because they do not possess the Holy Spirit. Beloved, none of you must hold this false notion that anyone who preaches the gospel, performs miracle or does great deeds possess the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible gives clear evidence that there is another spirit apart from the Holy Spirit that can do all these deeds. We read in Matthew chapter 11, verse 16 and 19. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not moan. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. Who is saying this? The Pharisees and the scribes, that is Bible scholars. Now hear this carefully. We read in the verse 19. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. John the Baptist had come to prepare the way for the Son of God. And while he observed a time of fasting and prayer in the wilderness, he used to eat only locusts and wild honey. When he began to preach about the baptism of repentance at the River Jordan, all the religious authorities and the intellectuals of those times accused him of being a madman, of possessing an evil spirit, for he barely ate. But Jesus Christ came eating and drinking. Yet, what were their assertions? Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of a tax collectors and sinners. So the whole lot of intellectuals and scholars of those times were neither able to receive the one sent by God to prepare the way for his son, nor were they able to accept the Savior sent by God. They were unable to recognize the deeds of wisdom that were fulfilled through John the Baptist and through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. What did God benefit from all the knowledge that these scholars had acquired? What did the children of God benefit from it? Nothing at all. 
What's worse is that it became a yoke for them and it became a hindrance to them in attaining salvation. So why did the Pharisees and priests of those times not accept John the Baptist? There are many reasons for this. Beloved, as per God's protocol, a prophet is greater than a priest. Simply because a prophet is the one whom God directly reveals his thoughts. He is the one who receives divine oracles directly from God. After receiving the words of God, he prophesies it blamelessly without altering it or manipulating it. The one who speaks with authority on behalf of God and thus reveals God's word is called a prophet. So, if they were to accept John the Baptist, the priest and the high priest of those times would have to be submissive to him. But their scholarliness would not permit them to do that. They wholeheartedly lusted after their thrones. Hence, to lower themselves before one who wore camel skin with a belt around his waist, who ate locusts and wild honey, whose dwelling was in the wilderness and who absolutely looked like a madman, for them to be submissive to such a one was not possible. But among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. But the greatest obstacle that stood in their way was their scholarliness their false pride that they knew everything. Beloved, God made a covenant on Mount Horeb that if you observe the statutes and ordinances that were given to Moses, then he would send a savior. When the savior comes, you have to do whatever he tells you. So Jesus Christ is that savior. When he came to this earth, all that he said had to be obeyed. And if we have to obey him, we must be inferior to him because all people obey and pay heed only to those individuals who are greater than them. But how did Jesus come on this earth? Though he was equal to God, he himself was God. Yet he came in the likeness of mortals. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. In this manner, a great and holy Lord humbled himself. At the same time, the great and honored Lord of priests and other superior authorities of the church stood before him. Those who were obeyed by all. In order to exalt Jesus Christ, make him superior so that all could obey him, what did John the Baptist do? John cut down the Pharisees, scribes and the rulers who were standing tall and in great pride before the Son of God so that they would be brought low and humbled. He looked them straight in the eye and called them, you brood of wipers. He caused them to be lowered before Jesus Christ. But why? So that they would be obedient to the Son of God. And this precisely is the will of God. What did John do after this? So that Jesus Christ may be lifted up, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. But the scribes and intellectuals of those times could not accept that. The high authorities of the church would not concede to it. Therefore, they were not even able to accept Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what has also occurred in his second coming. The Holy Bible clearly mentions in what form and circumstances the Son of God will be in when he returns to this earth. He has come in the most ordinary and lowly form. The Son of God, who is the source of all knowledge and wisdom, he is the source of all holiness and power and yet he emptied himself. So when he who has received all authority in heaven and on earth has returned to this earth in such a lowly position, 
The priests and the Bible scholars have enthroned themselves as holy and honorable. So, if they have to be submissive and obedient to the Son of God, they have to be brought low because they will never humble themselves. So even in his second coming, they did not have a heart to humble themselves before the prophet Isaiah who came to prepare the way for him. Therefore, beloved, the same errors that the scribes and the Pharisees committed 2,000 years ago, the same errors are reaching their fullness in today's Bible scholars and church authorities. Mark chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus said to them, Is not this a reason you are wrong? That you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. He said this to the Sadducees who came to argue with him concerning resurrection. Who were the Sadducees? The priests and the church officials who were entrusted with the responsibility of maintaining the duties of the Jerusalem temple were called Sadducees. So Jesus Christ is asking them, Is not this the reason you are wrong? That you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? Now as per their viewpoint, who is saying this to them? You must contemplate on these aspects. An ordinary carpenter from Nazareth of Galilee is telling the high priest, You do not know the holy scriptures. How would they react? They have spent their entire lives studying the Holy Scriptures. They have labored throughout their lives in order to excel in this. In the sight of all, they were held in great honor and were acknowledged as those who had complete understanding of the Holy Scriptures. To them, the Lord is saying, the reason you are wrong is that you do not know the Holy Scriptures. They were not able to accept this. So what was a testimony of the Son of God? The scholars and the priests of those times who claimed to possess complete knowledge in reality did not know the Holy Scriptures. In other words, they were not able to comprehend the true meaning that God intended to make known through this Holy Word. Everything else was known to them. They were well versed with the history and Hebrew context of the Holy Scriptures. They knew about the commentaries pertaining to it. That is, they were well acquainted with all that humans have deciphered concerning the Holy Scriptures. Even the expressions and emotions portrayed were known to them. So, in a nutshell, they knew everything pertaining to the Holy Scriptures except for that which had to be known. Who has testified this? The Son of God. Can he utter a lie? And this is precisely what God is testifying concerning today's Bible scholars. They know about many things. They are well versed with their Hebrew, Greek and Latin sources and also about the history and background of the Holy Scriptures. They are also thoroughly acquainted with Bible genealogy but they know nothing about what needs to be known. And because these scholars lack this knowledge, they commit mistakes. Therefore, they accuse the messenger who proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God, stating that he does not know anything. Can you imagine what God would have to say to these Bible scholars who make such accusations? Have you ever pondered upon the emotions that rush to the mind of God on hearing their words full of pride? Beloved, therefore it's important to discern who makes such accusations. We read in Luke chapter 10 verse 21. This scripture has been written very beautifully. We read, At that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. So, Jesus Christ is thanking God the Father. Why so? 
It's mentioned ahead. Because you have hidden these things. Which things? The secrets of the kingdom of God. Divine secrets. Divine wisdom. You have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Did you hear this carefully? God has hidden the mysteries concerning the secrets of the kingdom of God from the wise and the intelligent. Now, can anyone reveal what God has hidden? If God has determined to conceal it, can anyone uncover it? There are many who consider themselves as being wise. Honored, experts, great Bible scholars and stand in great pride in the presence of God. From them, God has concealed the secrets of the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ rejoiced immensely in this deed. Indeed, he thanked the Father for doing so. And this is exactly how his spirit is rejoicing even today. But to whom? Does God reveal everything to infants? Who are infants? Those who repent and humble themselves. Before whom must you humble yourself? Now, this is a biggest problem. Nowadays, people are willing to humble themselves before anybody just so that they may be glorified by others. But before whom? Did Jesus Christ humble himself? He said, I am gentle and humble in heart. What was his humility? Beloved, he lowered and humbled himself in the greatest way possible before God, before the words of God, before the deeds of God, and before the one sent by God. And this is the humility that he has shown us. Hence, those who humble themselves in this manner, by repenting and lowering themselves, they will be acknowledged as infants. And to them, God will reveal all these divine secrets. And what about the intellectuals? God conceals these mysteries for them. This is precisely what God is doing today. Beloved, the divine secrets that are revealed through the Sadhwata, the good news, are the secrets that were kept hidden for thousands of years. These secrets are pertaining to His divine plan, the plan to make us participants of His glory and immortality. When this good news started being proclaimed, why were these Bible scholars and intellectuals not able to comprehend these things? Simply, because God has concealed these secrets from them. And since they are concealed from them, they do not understand anything. So what do they end up doing? They slander it. What was their accusation against the one who proclaimed the good news? He doesn't know anything. One who lacks knowledge is speaking and those who lack knowledge are foolishly believing in him. These are the statements made by these great Bible scholars today. Beloved, we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 to 3, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now these are the Sadducees and Pharisees, leaders of the synagogue, teachers of the law, scribes, great intellectuals who are demanding this. He, Jesus, answered them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. Now, listen carefully. To the question Jesus asked them. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Beloved, the Son of God is asking the priest, the leaders of the synagogue, the scribes and the intellectuals of that time, you know how to predict the weather quite accurately. 
you are even able to interpret the appearance of the sky, then why are you not able to discern the signs of the times? So it's evident that in the first coming of Jesus Christ, God has given many signs to indicate the arrival of His Son on this earth. And Jesus Christ is clearly testifying that all those who presume that they were well versed with the Holy Scriptures, the intellectuals, none of them were able to discern these signs. However, Jesus Christ only said this as a parable. But the signs of the times will mostly be visible in the end times. In the Holy Bible, through the prophetic writings, through His Son and through the Apostles, God has revealed many signs that will occur in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the end times. Beloved, Whatever we read in the Bible concerning the signs of the times are those signs that will be fulfilled in the end times. So in the aforementioned scripture, the accusation made by Jesus Christ will be the greater significance in the end times. Today, many have become Bible scholars. They've studied theology. They've acquired PhDs in the Bible study and so on and so forth. But how many among these have been able to seek out and discern the signs of the times? Beloved, the Son of God has already come again to this earth and flesh. But before sending His Son, God gave many signs to discern the arrival of His Son on this earth. Now, He only has to be revealed before the world. That is, His glorious manifestation is at hand. The end of the ages is close at hand. And the sign to indicate and discern these times have already been given by God in many places all over the world. The exact same signs that are mentioned in the Holy Bible. These are those signs which no eye has seen, no ear has heard of until now. How many Bible scholars were able to pay heed to these signs? How many were able to recognize these signs? How many among these intellectuals were able to alert the children of God to prepare themselves by pointing out these signs to them? Not even one of them were able to do so. However, some preachers attended the Good News Retreat here and made notes and then proclaimed the same, stating that they had received these teachings through dreams or visions. And this is how they have started preaching concerning some of the signs of times. It consists of what they had noted down of all that is preached here in Zion. Then after receiving approval from their churches, they started preaching about these signs. But nowadays, they have swallowed up all their words. Now, basking in the glory of the churches, they are only singing praises of the church. So it's clear that these intellectuals cannot recognize the signs of times. Even today, they are oblivious of these signs. Even if someone were to point out these signs to them, they would disregard it. And this is only because paying heed to these signs would be reckoned as foolishness as for all the knowledge they have accumulated. And because they did not perceive these signs and have never even bothered to examine them, therefore, what is their reaction? When these signs are pointed out to intellectuals and Bible scholars, they make a mockery of it and disregard it, just as Pharaoh had disregarded the signs God had displayed through Moses. This is exactly what is happening today. We read in Luke chapter 7, verse 28 to 30. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So Jesus is saying, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. 
So through whom did Jesus Christ take birth? From a woman. The Son of God who was born of God, the Father, was brought into being in this world through a woman. Isn't Jesus undoubtedly greater than John the Baptist? And even the church considers Mother Mary as being superior to John. Then from whom did they take birth? Who is the woman through whom Jesus Christ took birth? How great is she? Has anyone ever tried to examine this? We read in verse 29, And all the people who heard this testimony of the Son of God, even the tax collectors and sinners, acknowledged the righteousness of God because they had received John's baptism. But the scribes and the Pharisees, who possess great knowledge, but refusing to be baptized by John, rejected God's purposes for themselves. Beloved, this is a great precedent mentioned in the Bible 2,000 years ago. The scribes and the Pharisees rejected God's purposes for themselves. What was that will of God that they rejected? We can read concerning this in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. They said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. The scripture is extremely important. Therefore, beloved, if someone has been sent by God, at that time, what is the will of God for everyone? To wholeheartedly believe in the one whom he has sent. To completely humble yourself before the one sent by God. To receive his words as the very words of God. To believe that the deeds fulfilled through him are the very deeds of God. This is the will of God. So, what was the error committed by the intellectuals, the scholars of those times? They disdained the will of God concerning themselves. And even today, history is repeating itself. Beloved, even today, what is God's greatest requirement of His children? That they believe in the one whom He sends. Why? Because the one sent by God bears the authority of God. And on this earth, only God possesses the supreme authority to carry out all the deeds of salvation. So, it's clear that the authority given to the one sent by God is the authority that God himself possesses. And we can find a very beautiful illustration of this in the Old Testament. When Moses said, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. Then God said, you call your brother Aaron. I know that he can speak fluently. You shall serve as God for him. Therefore, it is the will of God that we accept the words of the one sent by God or the words of the prophet as the very words of God. But all those who presumed they possess complete knowledge of the Holy Scriptures have disdained the will of God. Even today, they continue to do the same thing. They cannot even recognize this voice. Till today, their scholarliness have never been able to help them discern the source of this voice. Therefore, we must bear in mind this grave sin that has been committed by these great scholars. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13 verse 27 Because the residents of Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize him or understand the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled those words by condemning him. There are many significant aspects about this scripture, beloved. Paul is preaching this in Antioch to the residents of Jerusalem and their leaders. That is, 
those who possess knowledge, the scribes, the Pharisees and the priests. What did they do? They did not recognize the Savior who was sent to them by God. They did not know the Savior whom they had been waiting for 1,500 years. Then what did they do? They failed to comprehend the words of the prophets that were read every Sabbath. Who is testifying this? The Holy Spirit. So when Jesus Christ came to this earth, it was these intellectuals, the scribes, the Pharisees and the priests who claimed that they knew everything. In the same way, when John the Baptist began preaching, the very same Lord claimed that they knew everything. And so, what was the fate that befell them? They failed to comprehend the words that the prophet that were read every Sabbath. And it is for this reason that Jesus Christ denounced them, stating that, Is not this the reason you are wrong? And that you know neither the scripture nor the power of God? And this is what Paul is testifying, that all these scribes and scholars have not understood the intended meaning of the words of the prophets that were read every Sabbath. And today, it's still the same. Beloved, these are today's renowned Bible scholars and so-called anointed ones, the intellectuals. They have studied abroad, obtained PhDs. They teach in universities. They have many honored titles conjoined to their names. They are highly acclaimed by all people. Yet the Holy Spirit is testifying that these Bible scholars do not know the prophetic writings. They have not even perceived its intended meaning, but they will never admit this. The scholars for sure will not admit this, especially those who are highly renowned. Neither will their devoted followers believe this. But this is the absolute truth. As we read in John chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. Therefore, beloved, what was the error of the intellectual scribes and the religious leaders of those times? They made judgments based on human standards. They judged on outer appearances. Hence, their judgments were unrighteous. And their greatest downfall was they judged based on human perceptions. Therefore, through Paul, the Holy Spirit has given us a severe warning. As written in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So beloved, their greatest error was that they perceived everything from a human point of view. And assuredly, if you view the one sent by God from a human perspective, you will stumble. If you had to view Jesus Christ when he came 2000 years ago from a human perspective, then what would you see? Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph the carpenter. But when Peter exclaimed, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, then what did Jesus Christ say? Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So it is the heavenly father who gives us the divine point of view so that the true image of every individual may be revealed to us. Jesus Christ has said, no one knows who the Son is except the Father. Therefore, if we have to identify the Son of God who has come again in flesh and also discern the one sent by God to prepare the way, then we have to receive this divine perception from God. And He has to reveal this to you. It is God who has to give you this conviction. But if your opinions are based on human perspective, your judgment will be flawed. What is the mistake most commonly made by intellectual religious leaders? 
Bible scholars and priests. From a human point of view, they scrutinized the messenger of the good news. All that was proclaimed through the good news, the establishment called Zion and the deeds of God. And this is their mistake. They have to pray so that they may receive the divine perspective. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals the thoughts of God to us. Therefore, it's clear that it is because the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in them that they have become enslaved to a human way of thinking. And not only the prophetic writings, but these Bible scholars also view every word of God from a human perspective. They have rejected the divine source, the divine purposes of the Holy Scriptures. Just as many aspects of history and cultures are interpreted, these scholars interpret the Bible in the same manner. Just as they debate over interpretation of these topics, they debate over interpretations of the Bible as well. Humans who are but worms are attempting to dictate the study of God. Man who has a history of utilizing only that which is borrowed, is writing a thesis on God, who is the creator of all things. So how can a generation that is so greatly swollen with pride be able to submit before the one sent by God? How will they be able to humble themselves before the wisdom of God? Their viewpoint is as per human standards. We must understand these things. As written in John chapter 9, verse 28 to 32. Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. Then they reviled him, saying, Who reviled him? So the background of this scripture is that Jesus Christ had healed a man who was born blind. He spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on this man's eyes and told him to go and wash it in the pool of Siloam. Then the man went and washed and was able to see. His eyes were opened. Now this man was born blind. So the authorities, the intellectuals, the Pharisees, the priests kept on questioning him repeatedly. But he held fast to his testimony of what Jesus Christ had done for him. So they reviled this man who was born blind but had received his eyesight and said to him, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. Beloved, we have already seen how the Son of God himself has testified that although they claim to be disciples of Moses, in truth, they have not even believed in Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Now the one who was born blind replies, pay heed to his response. Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Until that time, the scribes and the religious leaders had been teaching the people that this man was born blind either because of his sins or because of the sins of his parents. Then this man who was deemed as being born a sinner, who was just an ordinary man, is exclaiming, We know that God does not listen to sinners. So this man who was born blind declared that the one who gave him sight was not a sinner, 
that he worships God in truth and only fulfills the will of God. Beloved, you don't need a PhD to understand what he has declared here. And anyone standing there at that time who had common sense would have understood that what this man is saying is absolutely right. But those who claim to possess all knowledge were not even able to accept such a simple fact. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. So this man has done something which has never been done before. And yet, these intellectuals are stating that we do not know where he comes from. The man who was born blind found this to be astonishing. Therefore, beloved, the pride within these scholars will neither permit them to see the deeds of God, nor allow them to acknowledge the greatness of his deeds. And today, the situation is no different. The same mistakes are being repeated today. All those who think they possess great knowledge have never been able to see the deeds of God, nor have they been able to glorify God. No, they will never be able to do so. Then in John chapter 9, verse 22, we read, His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. Whose parents? The parents of the man who was born blind, but whom Jesus had healed. These intellectual priests and Pharisees were unwilling to believe in this deed and were refusing to acknowledge it. Therefore, they called the parents of the man to ascertain the facts. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And today, they are doing the same deed. Whoever believes in the proclamation of the one sent by God, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has come again in flesh, the church authorities and the leaders excommunicate them from their churches. But all this is a repetition of what took place back then. But in actuality, what should they have been done? They should have guided the people by declaring to them that this is Christ for whom the Jews have been waiting. Instead, they decided that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue and they even declared this in all the synagogues. We can read further on that even the man who was born blind was removed from the synagogue and this is exactly what they are doing today. They not only excommunicate from their churches those who believe in the name of Emperor Emmanuel, but also shun them in their communities. They keep on harassing and persecuting them. This is what is done by those who think they possess knowledge. Through news channels and other media sources, they keep on spreading false rumors. Nothing they say is true. They choose to slander to their heart's content. Through the spirit of blasphemy, they keep on uttering slander. Who blasphemes? If you search the scriptures, you will find it written that day and night, Satan slanders the holy ones in the presence of God. We see this in the book of Job. So now we see that those who are filled with this spirit continually slander the children of God who are acknowledged as the holy ones of God. These are the characteristics of the spirit that is dwelling within them. These scholars are doing the same thing that the intellectuals of those times had done. Beloved, you can examine all about the prophets of the Old Testament. Were any of them great scholars? Examine every single prophet. Very few of them were priests. Jeremiah was a son of a priest. We can see that Ezekiel was a priest. But most of them were shepherds or farmers. 
those who had no grounds for boasting about their greatness before the people. They had no distinction as per earthly standards. They were ordinary people who were not very scholarly. Beloved, even the people of those times never sought the intellect of the prophets. Rather, they sought the prophecies that came forth from them. Only the ordinary people were able to believe that the words spoken by the prophets were the very words of God. These were able to discern and accept that all that came forth from the prophets were the words of God, the voice of God, the discipline of God, the promises of God, as well as the admonitions of God. However, the priests refused to accept them. Now, there are many who are mocking and slandering the messenger of the good news and the children of God who believe in him. Their accusations being these people have no knowledge. They are not very learned. Now, if they were alive during the time of the prophets or of Jesus Christ, would they be able to believe in them? No! they would have repeated the same mistakes they are doing now. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 and 16. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they, who are they? The religious leaders, the intellectuals, they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets. So this is a common trait found in all those who claim to possess knowledge. Until the wrath of the Lord against his people became so great that there was no remedy. All the prophets who were sent before Jesus Christ, who had come to prepare the way for him, were all ridiculed and greatly persecuted by the authorities, the so-called scholars of those times. We read in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 and 52. Stephen is speaking to the authorities of that time. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit. Who are these people? Those who think they know everything. Just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? Now, who were the ancestors of the priests to whom Stephen was addressing this statement? They also were priests. For priesthood inherited by order of birth. So, through Stephen, the Holy Spirit was declaring that all the prophets that were sent by God were all persecuted by the priests, the religious leaders and all the so-called scholars. And this is what is happening today. They are repeating the same errors of their ancestors. Therefore, beloved, in Luke Chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, it is written, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on the account of the Son of Man. And this is what is happening today. The Son of Man is none other than the Son of God, Emperor Emmanuel, who has come again in flesh. On his account, they will hate you, defame you, revile you and exclude you. And those who hold fast to their faith in him, when they are treated in this manner, they are blessed. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven for their ancestors. The people who are now mistreating those who believe in Emperor Emmanuel are doing what their ancestors did to the prophets. It is for this reason that I said that those who persecute the children of God and those who blaspheme against the one sent by God are the descendants of the very people who persecuted the prophets. When you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 22 and 23, 
you will understand that all this will take place in the end times. We read in Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. So here we are seeing two aspects of the characteristics of these so-called scholars. They slander, persecute and even murder the prophets that are sent by God. But they speak very highly about all the false prophets. They support them and glorify them. Why do they do so? Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 26 to 28 answers this question. His priests have done violence to my teaching and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Is the situation today any different? There are many things that God has called profane, but they call them holy. And what God calls holy, they call profane. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And this was the covenant of priesthood that was made with Levi. They had to teach the people of God the difference between right and wrong, between light and darkness, and between good and evil. It has to be good in whose sight? What is good in God's sight? You have to teach as being good. And what is evil in God's sight? You have to teach as being evil. This is the covenant of priesthood. Today, this covenant is being violated. And they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. It's officials. Who are these officials? The leaders of the various churches. Its officials within it are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. If you read the news regularly, you will understand what is being said here. And who are these prophets? The innumerous gospel preachers and other leaders. Its prophets have smeared whitewash on their behalf, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. This is what we have recently seen on the news. A preacher was saying, when the authorities of the church commit a mistake, you must cover it up with bed sheets. Another preacher said, we must whitewash or justify the mistake. So, today's churches are filled with such whitewashers and these liars are whitewashing all the sins and faults of the church authorities. This is how they have been shielding them. Therefore, all these religious leaders have been supporting and glorifying such false prophets before others. All this has already been written down by the Father and this is exactly what is happening today. Now, 2,000 years ago, how did these intellectuals and scholars view the apostles? Were they able to believe in them? Read Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. When the apostles were preaching, then these scholars and leaders summoned Peter and John to the Jewish Sanhedrin Council of Elders. Now this council consists of the priest, high priest, teachers of the law and church authorities. After calling Peter and John, what did they say to them? They ordered them not to speak or teach at all in this name. So all those who think they know everything, what will they say? Do not preach the gospel. Do not tell us about the one sent by God. We don't want to hear anything about salvation. Isn't this precisely what all intellectuals and Bible scholars are doing today? Don't tell us anything about Emperor Emmanuel. We don't want to know anything about the Son of God or about the one who is sent to give us the fullness of salvation. Don't tell us anything about the prophets who are sent to prepare the way for him. We don't want to hear anything about eternal life. So, what do these scholars do? They create obstacles for those who are preaching the gospel. The Jews had done the very same thing. 
All those who possess knowledge have repeated the same errors. Wherever the apostles went, these scholars and intellectuals kept on creating obstacles in their way. When you read the book of the Acts of the Apostles, this will become crystal clear to you. For instance, when Paul was preaching in Antioch, not only that, every place they went, those who claimed to possess great knowledge would instigate the people against them. For example, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, verse 45 and 50. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming, they contradicted what was spoken by Paul. And this is what they are doing today as well. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. So, have you been able to comprehend how they treated the apostles? Because this is exactly what they are doing today. Beloved, you can examine the preaching of Jesus Christ. Has he ever preached as per human standards of intellectuality? Ponder over this. Back then, the people were amazed at his teachings. Why? Because of the words of wisdom and because of the words of grace that poured forth from him. Beloved, he never preached about scholarliness. He never spoke about the original Hebrew context of the prophetic writings or the state of affairs of the anthropology. Did he even try to interpret the creative literature of those times? Did he dictate any interpretation of the Holy Scriptures? He only fulfilled the Holy Scriptures. He only fulfilled what the prophets had prophesied concerning him, which were written in the prophetic writings. Beloved, the Lord never interpreted the scriptures. The Lord never proclaimed about scholarliness. And the scribes, the learned ones of that time, could not bear this at all. Beloved, what is the qualification of the one who preaches the good news? What form of knowledge should the children of God seek from him? When we read the Holy Bible, we observe that there is a prayer mentioned in the letter to the Ephesians. We read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So, in the end times, the fullness of the word of God and the divine secrets that have been hidden in the word of God must be revealed to us. And we have already examined that God has to send someone to reveal all these things to us. Beloved, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 25 we read, I became a servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The duty is to fully reveal the word of the Lord. So the Holy Bible testifies about the one who will be entrusted with this responsibility. And he will send to us and will reveal the word of God to us in fullness. There are many secrets hidden in the word of God. And the Bible clearly states that these will be revealed only in the end times. If it is so, then how great is the knowledge and the revelation that the Lord has granted to the one who is to reveal all these secrets? He will not preach worldly wisdom. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden. More than Paul and all the other apostles, this statement stands even more true concerning the one who proclaims the good news in these end times. Because in comparison with them, the one sent by God has revealed far more mysteries of divine wisdom in these end times. Therefore, beloved, the messenger of the good news has proclaimed God's wisdom, which is secret and hidden. 
But these Bible scholars have not perceived this. And it's clearly written here that they will never be able to understand this. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. Who are these? The church authorities, the Bible scholars, those who claim to be anointed by God. None of them have understood this. Neither then nor now. Why? Because this divine wisdom is secret and hidden. Now the knowledge that the one sent to proclaim the good news possesses is not merely earthly knowledge. But these intellectuals who have studied in universities for many years, who have read many books, who discern as per their own imagination, those who view everything as per their own research will not understand this. Because with him is divine wisdom, which is eternally radiant, secret and hidden. Those with excess knowledge will not perceive this. You cannot study about this in theology institutes, Bible college or any other university. Neither can you hear about this from any other individuals. As we read in Romans chapter 16 verse 26. But is now disclosed and through the prophetic writing is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. So what did the messenger of the good news preach about? He preached about those mysteries that were kept hidden for ages. It is concerning the wisdom of God which were hidden. The one in whom is the spirit of God, the spirit of word, the spirit of wisdom. In him is filled the wisdom and revelation. It was kept hidden until now. Why is it being preached? Not to get a PhD through it, neither to analyze it, nor to research about it, and not even to debate about it, but to bring about the obedience of faith, to hear it, believe it, and to obey it. Only the children of God will be able to do this. All others will slander and blaspheme. As we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse 3 and 4. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. Who is testifying to this? The Holy Spirit. So the words of the messenger of God have not come forth due to deceit or impure motives or trickery. Beloved, when Paul had uttered these words, were the priests, the leaders, the anointed ones of those times able to accept it? Instead, they had tried their best to get rid of him at any cost. They had even handed him over to the Romans to get him killed. So, when the authorities of those times heard the preaching of Paul, would they be able to testify that this teaching does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery? So neither will the priest, the Bible scholars and other religious leaders say this concerning the messenger sent by God. They would never agree to it because if they admit this, then they would have to lower themselves before him. They would have to obey him. They would have to be submissive before him. So at no cost would they let this happen. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals. Sorry, but human approval is not required. The one sent by God does not require such approval. The messenger of God sent by God to proclaim the good news does not need the approval of church leaders or any other authority. Because he is greater than all of them. Approval is sought from those who are superior, not from those who are inferior. Above everyone else, he has the approval of Emperor Emmanuel and of the Almighty God who transcends everyone and everything. 
So the approval of people is not required. Even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. So it is enough to please the one who has granted him this authority, the one who has approved and elected him. Neither does the messenger of the good news nor does Zion seek to please the people of this world. The people of God must know the difference between the authority and approval that is given by God and that which is given by man. Especially those who pay heed to these Bible scholars and church authorities who presume that these intellectuals know everything. We must be able to discern what is pleasing to God and what is pleasing to mortals. Because if we fail to do so, if we fail to view this from the right perspective, we will falter in our ways. Therefore, beloved, the one sent by God has not preached about vain things, things that do not benefit anyone. He has only preached those things that are essential to attain eternal salvation. As we read in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 21. And do not turn aside after useless things that cannot profit or save, for they are useless. So, all form of scholarliness that exists today are all pertaining to these useless things. They will not be able to help us attain salvation. But the words of the one sent by God lead us to eternal life. That is, they are crucial to attain salvation. His words are truth. But those who are habituated to speaking vain things and those who are accustomed to hearing such teachings will not be able to discern this. There's no use of saying this man has no knowledge because his teachings are not consistent with our doctrines. Instead of slandering like this, they must pray in the presence of God so that they may receive the gift to comprehend the divine wisdom that comes forth from him. Beloved, now what are the accusations they make against those who believe in the good news? They are foolish people who do not know anything. They are not even acquainted with the basics of the Bible. They know nothing about theology. They have no work of life and such people are wandering about proclaiming the good news. These are their accusations. As written in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. Consider your own call brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. These words have so much depth to shame intellectuals and scholars. God has chosen those who are foolish in the sight of the world instead of those who think they know everything. You can find it written in the Bible that many are called but few are chosen. Who will receive this election? Those who seem foolish in the eyes of the world. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are. Beloved, this is a beautiful scripture. What kind of people does God choose? The time when the purpose of this election reaches its fullness is in the end times. The Son of God has attained the fullness of salvation and He will come to take us along with Him to the eternal dwelling place prepared by the Father. And this is what is mentioned here. So, who receives this election? Those who are foolish by worldly standards. Those who are insignificant in this world. Those who are despised. Who are big zero. Therefore, 
those who accuse the children of God, who believe in the good news that is proclaimed in Zion, saying they don't know anything. They are fools. To them, Zion children boldly proclaim, in our foolishness, in our insignificance, in our nothingness, we take pride. Beloved, God's election is carried out in this way so that no one might boast in the presence of God. This is what the scripture testifies. The one who has been sent by God has been sent filled with divine wisdom, revelation and knowledge of God. Those who do not comprehend this when they see others believing in the one sent by God, they won't be able to tolerate it. Therefore, they deride them by calling them ignorant and stupid. This is what the Jewish scribes and the priests did back then when the soldiers they had sent to arrest Jesus returned empty-handed. They said, but this crowd which does not know the law, they are cursed. Today's Bible scholars say the same thing. It is for this reason that God's election is done in this manner. Therefore, seeing this election, the church leaders, so-called scholars, feel jealous and get infuriated. Therefore, this prophecy that was made during the time of Moses is being fulfilled now in the end times. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. They made me jealous with what is no God. Today all the prominent churches are doing this. They have provoked me with their idols. An incident that took place quite recently within the premises of the church headquarters is a perfect example of this. So I will make them jealous with what is no people, provoke them with a foolish nation. So all the scholars and the church leaders get enraged when they look at the messenger of the good news and at those who believe in the good news. But this must be made known to all, that it is God himself who provokes them. The people whom they judge as being fools by such a foolish nation, God will provoke the great and the honored ones of this world. And all this will take place now. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to 20. Do not deceive yourselves. God is saying, this to those who presume they are great scholars in this world. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. So, it's very clear that those who think that they are intelligent in this world are not so in the presence of God. Therefore, those who take pride in the fact that they possess knowledge, they must first become fools in this world in order to be acknowledged as wise in the presence of God. Zion is the only group of people whom God has made as fools in the sight of the world so that they may be acknowledged as wise in the sight of God. The people who have believed the good news for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So the intellectuals and the Bible scholars who boast that they possess the wisdom of the scriptures of the Lord are nothing but fools in the eyes of the Lord. This is what the Spirit of the Lord declares. This is a testimony of the Holy Spirit. Hence, God is proving them to be foolish who say, we know everything. We have studied about this. This is not what it means. This is not what is written in the original Greek text. This is not mentioned in the original Hebrew text. This is its correct interpretation. And these are the people who take pride in their scholarliness and worldly knowledge. Because their knowledge will neither profit them nor God. Neither will it help them attain salvation. Therefore, they consider this to be foolishness. It's clearly mentioned in the Bible. 
He takes the wise in their own craftiness and the schemes of the wily are brought to nothing. All these scriptures will be proved true in the end times and God will prove this before them that all that they consider as honorable and knowledge in reality is absolute foolishness. At that time, all these scriptures will be fulfilled. Therefore, beloved, there is sought to whitewashing in the name of scholarliness. They do this to justify and conceal their hardness of heart, the renunciation of faith and their lack of a repentant heart. This is what is happening today. The scholastic excellence of all who claim to possess complete knowledge of the Bible is just a masquerade to cover up all the acts of desecration as we read in Acts chapter 13, verse 38 to 41. Let it be known to you, therefore, my brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. By this Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from all those sins from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, that what the prophet said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, be amazed and perish, for in your days I am doing a work, a work that you'll never believe, even if someone tells you. That's why God is saying to them, Look, you scoffers, be amazed. Why will they be amazed? God will do such a deed that they would never be able to accept because of their scholarliness. It will be a deed that their minds will not permit them to believe because of the excess knowledge they possess. Perish. What does it mean to perish or disappear? If you read the book of Numbers chapter 16, it would be clear to you. This is what it means to perish or disappear. They slander the voice that God has resounded in Zion through the messenger whom he has sent only because it is not along the lines of their scholasticism. They say it's all foolishness. But those who revile and ridicule God's voice in this manner will be the target of God's wrath. So beloved, we have already seen what tragedies have befallen the priests and the religious authorities who lived 2,000 years ago. And all of this was only because their scholarliness and their boasted knowledge and the people of God should be able to discern that this will reach its peak in these end times. They have failed to perceive the wisdom of God and his holy words. As a result, they continually hurl insults and accusations. But what we must understand is that the Holy Bible clearly testifies that they are headed towards eternal destruction. Beloved, the word of God warns us once again, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Therefore, it is wrongly assumed by many that divine wisdom is acquired by excelling in worldly knowledge or by being acknowledged as wise in this world. It cannot be acquired by studying in a Bible college, by acquiring a PhD or studying the original Greek, Hebrew or Latin text of the Bible. It's not even necessary that by reading innumerable interpretation of renowned patriarchs of the church that one would receive divine wisdom. Beloved, God through the spirit of wisdom reminds us of a beautiful scripture. We read in Wisdom chapter 9 verse 6. For even one who is perfect among human beings will be regarded as nothing without the wisdom that comes from you. This is a scripture that Bible scholars need to safeguard in their hearts. Even if someone is perfect among men, but if he does not have the knowledge that comes from you, O Lord, then he is nothing. Therefore, it becomes clear 
through this scripture that one must consider as perfect among humans even though he lacks divine wisdom. You must understand this, that even though a person may be lacking in divine wisdom, people would still claim that he is highly acclaimed as one who has reached the apex of knowledge. But all that they utter is not wisdom of God. It is worldly knowledge. They are filled with the knowledge of this world. They only rely on this knowledge and therefore they are puffed up with false pride. Hence, they slander against the truth, that is God's word, against divine wisdom and against those sent by God. They continually ridicule and slander, stating that these people are foolish. Therefore, the wisdom of God declares in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, it's the Holy Mother who's calling out saying, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. If you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. Therefore, beloved, we must stand in the presence of God as is written in the word of God. We should pray, Lord, fill us with your holy wisdom. Without receiving this wisdom, you will not even be able to comprehend admonition of God or recognize the wisdom concealed in the works of God. Therefore, the so-called Bible scholars who fail to acquire this wisdom remain completely blinded by the knowledge of this world. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That is why they blaspheme it. Therefore, beloved, these great scholars have always blasphemed and continue to do so even today, stating that these people have no knowledge. They have no knowledge, but truly it is they who have failed to recognize the glorious light of the gospel. I have shared all these scriptures so that the children of God who have been led astray by their false teachings may now hear the truth and be able to accept the light of God's word and prepare themselves for his glorious manifestation. Therefore, I pray that the Lord, by his great mercy, open our inner eyes to see his light and shower his compassion on each one of us. Amen.